Good, so, uh, so it's a pleasure to be here uh, again. Uh, thanks for the invitation, thanks for coming. Uh, thanks also for uh, watching uh, uh, by uh, Zoom. And, uh, and this is a modest audience, so feel free to uh, interact whenever you have uh, uh, questions or, uh, uh, or comments. Uh, and, uh, uh, and as you see, I'll, uh, I'll speak about uh, typical norms. Uh, so, uh, so this is a subject in uh, combinatorial uh, geometry. Uh, and it's uh, uh, from recent uh, joint work with uh, uh, Matja uh, Bucic, uh, who is uh, uh, here and, uh, uh, at the uh, university, but, uh, but today he's still uh, on his uh, on his way uh, here, like you can uh, you can see a, a two-dimensional uh, version of him uh, here, and uh, uh, and it's also with uh, Lisa uh, Sauerman uh, from MIT. So, uh, as the title suggests, uh, I talk mostly about uh, general norms, but uh, but it's good to. Uh, uh, motivate it or to start with uh, Euclidean norms. And, uh, uh, and let me start with the unit distance uh, problem. So, so the unit distance problem is uh, arguably the uh, most uh, uh, important uh, open problem in uh, uh, combinatorial geometry. And, uh, and here I'm quoting uh, from the book by uh, Brass, Moser, and Pach, uh, a research problem in discrete uh, geometry uh, published in uh, 2005. And this is very simple to state. Uh, uh, it was uh, uh, formulated by uh, Erdős in a, a very short paper in the monthly in 1946. And uh, what it asks is uh, what is the maximum possible number of unit distances determined by n points in the Euclidean plane. So we have n points and we look at all the n choose two distances and we want to have the same distance as many times as we uh, can. And in particular, the question is if this maximum is just barely nonlinear, is it uh, n to the one plus little o one? And the best known bounds are what you see here. So the lower bound comes from the grid. It appears already in the original paper by Erdes. We take a square root n by square root n grid. And what we want is to find an integer that can be written in many different ways as a sum of two squares. So uh, we take a, a product of uh, distinct primes that are one modulo four. And uh, uh, this is some uh, basic uh, effects uh, uh, about the Gaussian integers. And if you uh, work out the asymptotics, then the lower bound is n raised to the power of one plus constant over log log n. And the, and the best known upper bound uh, was uh, first uh, proved by uh, Spencer, Simmerady, and Trotter. Uh, uh, in uh, 84, and it's n to the four thirds up to a constant. And, uh, uh, and since then, uh, there have been uh, uh, quite a few simpler proofs saying, uh, of the same bound, which is still conjectured to be uh, pretty far from being tight. Uh, and the most uh, elegant one is by Seke, and this is based on the uh, crossing lemma of uh, Leighton and of uh, Altaich, uh, Vatal, Newborn, and uh, Semeredi. And using this really is a, a proof of the upper bound is a few lines, uh, including the proof of this uh, crossing lemma. Uh, it's still a few lines, but uh, clever lines. Uh. Uh, okay, uh, now uh, first Ulam, and, uh, and soon after he may have this, uh, uh, considered also the question of what happens for general norms. We don't want to look only at Euclidean norms, but we have now a general norm. So let me uh, define, since I'll use the notion of a D-norm and all, so I'll call it a D-norm. This is just a, a, any real norm on R to the D, a D-dimensional norm. 
And uh, equivalently, you can think about it by the unit ball of this norm, which is a, a centrally symmetric, convex, compact body centered at the origin, uh, like the one you see here. So this tells us uh, what is a unit distance in any direction. And if we have such a norm, then we can define by u corresponding to this norm n, this will be the maximum possible number of unit distances uh, uh, we can have a, a, a determined by endpoints according to this norm. And once the norm will be uh, clear from the context, uh, then I just uh, denote it by, uh, by u of n. So we want to, uh, uh, we cannot say anything new about the Euclidean case, but maybe we want to say something about uh, general uh, norms. Uh, uh, so here is a simple effect that was uh, we observed uh, uh, early on. And this is that if the norm is not strictly convex, namely uh, the unit sphere, the boundary of the unit wall contains a line segment, uh, as is, uh, for example, the case in the uh, L infinity norm in, uh, in the plane that you see here, then it's easy to see that uh, uh, that this maximum number of unit distances is at least n square over four, because we can realize a complete by partite graph, right? We take a, a, a unit a ball of a diameter one, and we put half of the points uh, on one line segment, and half of the points on the uh, opposite uh, symmetric line segment, and then all the distances between a point from here and a point from here are one. So we get a lot, and uh, uh, one can also show that the correct constant is one quarter. Uh, it's not, uh, this is kind of an easy uh, case, which is not so interesting. On the other hand, uh, uh, if a two norm, so let's talk now about the plane, if it is strictly convex, uh, uh, then uh, uh, basically all the proofs that give the uh, known upper bound of n to the four thirds work for this general case as well. So n to the four thirds is also an upper bound. And uh, in Falter, and maybe more uh, generally, uh, Shorimoshi and Sabo uh, constructed uh, some uh, strictly convex two norms, uh, uh, showing that this is time in which you can put the endpoints and get n to the four thirds uh, unit distances. Uh, so it means that uh, this uh, uh, question is uh, uh, pretty much uh, understood, and uh, the more challenging one uh, is the following, uh, how small can this u of n be? So can, is there any two norm, or maybe more generally d norm, for which whenever you put n points and the number of unit distances is very small? Well, it cannot be completely uh, linear, and this is because uh, there is a very simple argument showing that uh, for any two norm, it is at least something like half n log n. You can always put n points and get about half n log n uh, uh, unit distances. And, uh, and here is uh, the proof, uh, let's say for n, which is a power of two, you just, uh, so if n is two to the k, you just take k random directions, any direction you want, in each direction, you take a unit vector with this dimension, and you take all the subset sums. These are the points, okay? And, uh, uh, and you see that for each subset sum, each point here is of distance exactly one from k other points, because in the subset sum, you just have to change one coordinate. And then the difference is plus or minus this uh, unit vector, and, uh, uh, and here you see an example of the three cube. This just says that the k cube, the graph of the k cube, is a subgraph of the unit distance graph in any two norm. Right? So we can always get a, a half n log n, and one can, uh, in fact, a little bit improve the constant here, but let's not worry about it now. And uh, uh, and see, the question is, uh, uh, how close is this uh, to the truth? So it looks pretty hard to prove a good upper bound for an explicit norm. 
but what we uh, often know in uh, dealing with uh, extremal uh, problems is that, uh, uh, that it's uh, often helpful to, uh, to try to consider random examples. So maybe we want to take a random uh, two norm and try to show that this is nearly tight. And it turns out that here, uh, I mean, one can look at some notions of random norms, but uh, but it seems better uh, to use here topology instead of probability, and then the random will be with respect to the uh, topology, as I'll explain soon. And this approach was taken by uh, Matushek uh, about 10 years ago. And what he uh, showed is that for most norms, and I say what, uh, uh, what is meant by uh, most here, then the maximum number of unit distances determined by n points uh, with respect to this norm is not more than an absolute constant times n times log n times log log. So it's pretty close to this uh, n log n. And, uh, and, and let me tell you what, uh, uh, what is meant by most here. Okay. So, uh, so the technical term is that most is all norms but a meager set. And let me say what is a meager set. Okay. So we define the Hausdorff distance between two compact sets A and B in RD. So this is just the maximum distance between a point of A and the set B and the point of B and the set A. So two sets are closed in the Hausdorff distance. If and only if every point of one is close to some point of the other and vice versa. Okay, so this is a, a distance, it a, a makes a set of all the uh, possible unit balls, say, uh, a metric space, right? Because we have the motion of a metric, and, uh, and therefore there is a natural uh, topology uh, defined on it. Uh, and in this topology, we can uh, define uh, as usual what it means for a set to be lower dense. So it is not dense in any open set. What this means is that uh, every, so a set S is lower dense if every open set U contains another non empty open set V that does not intersect S. So this is uh, to be lower zero dense and uh, uh, and the set is meager if it is a union of countably many lower dense uh, sets. So, uh, so it is known that uh, uh, the space of all D norms, namely all potential unit balls, is what is called the pair space. And this means it's a complement of any meager set is dense. In particular, uh, the complement of uh, any uh, meager set is non empty. It contains a lot of norms. In fact, for every norm, you can perturb it slightly, as slightly as you want, and get something uh, outside this uh, mirror set. And, uh, uh, and with this notion, uh, the result of Matushek uh, formulated uh, now formally uh, is that for all D norms but a mirror set, then any N points and uh, uh, sorry, uh, this D has to be two, so we <coughs> many four dimension two. So for all two norms, uh, but a meager set, uh, any N points in the plane uh, determines at most N log N log log N times some constant uh, uh, unity sets. And, uh, and of course, uh, uh, this suggests uh, uh, the natural question that, uh, that you ask, say, if the log log n is uh, needed, we said that every two norm, uh, uh, this uh, uh, u of n is at least uh, some constant uh, n log n, and the upper bound is n log n log log n, and, uh, uh, and the question is if the log log n can be removed, uh, uh, people were interested in higher dimension as well. So here is a question of, uh, uh, of Russ from the uh, late 19s. Is it true that in dimension three and more, whenever we take a D norm, 
then the uh, number of uh, unit distances uh, uh, it uh, uh, determines by some uh, clever choice of uh, endpoints is asymptotically more than a Note that uh, in the Euclidean uh, space, we get a higher power just by taking uh, in, in to the one third by n to the one third by n to the one third uh, grid. Uh, and, uh, uh, and then just by pigeonhole, uh, we get uh, the same distance appearing at least 10 to the four thirds seven uh, times. Uh, and, uh, and yet another question, uh, 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 and this one uh, is uh, from this book by Brass Moser et Bach. Uh, is it true that for any dimension at least four, uh, there is a D norm with a U of n being subquadratic? You see, if we are in the Euclidean uh, space, then from dimension four and up, uh, we can take two orthogonal circles. And therefore, the number of unit distances is quadratic. And in fact, the same holds for any LP norm in dimension, at least four. In fact, for any norm in which the formula for the norm is some function of the sum of functions of the individual coordinates. Because then you can take many possibilities for the first two coordinates with many possibilities for the second two coordinates and make sure that uh, all of these cross uh, distances will be one. So, uh, so maybe it's not uh, uh, unreasonable to, uh, uh, to ask uh, uh, this question here. Uh, so let me see it again. So these are the uh, three questions and basically uh, we can solve uh, uh, all of them. Uh, so, uh, so the answer to the first one is yes, the lower way can be removed. The answer to the second one is a no, a, no namely, even in dimension three, we can do n log n. And in fact, in any dimension d, in any fixed dimension d, the correct uh, uh, behavior uh, is uh, there is some norm. Uh, <laughs> So that the maximum number of unit distances you can determine in this norm still has a, a behavior of a, uh, n log n up to the dependence of the dimension. So in a very strong sense, uh, uh, the answer uh, for the third question is yes. And, uh, and once we knew uh, this uh, uh, with uh, Matia and Lisa, we became more greedy and uh, wanted to know about the dependence uh, on the dimension D. Okay? And, uh, uh, and actually all this uh, is holds for most norms. Uh, again, it's a bare category sense that I mentioned uh, before. So, uh, so here is a, a theorem. Uh, it says that for every fixed dimension D, at least two, and for every N, uh, if we take a typical D norm in the same sense as we saw for, so for all norms but a meager set, then there is a, uh, a then for every set of n points, the number of unit distances uh, uh, they uh, determine is at most half D n log base two of n. And here, by the way, nothing is asymptotic, so no assumptions that n is big with respect to D. This is true for every n and every D. Uh, uh, you never get a, a more than this. And on the other hand, uh, this is uh, not far from being a, a tight, uh, a, again, in a very strong sense, uh, in the sense that for every fixed D at least two, and for every N here, you have to assume that N is a big as a, a function, uh, as a function of D, uh, and for every D norm, you can always find some endpoints that determine, well, almost. So instead of half D, you get half D minus one, minus little one. And in fact, uh, uh, this, uh, so the gap is pretty small between the lower and upper bound, uh, but the lower bound can in fact be still slightly improved uh, for small dimension C. So in particular for D equals two, uh, maybe it will be between n log n is the upper bound 
and here you can push it to about two thirds and okay. Yeah. So did the matsec proof uh, also give a log and log log, log n result for higher dimensions or really study the question? Okay. I was wondering the matusek paper, the pro the approach in the paper does not really work in higher dimensions. So I was not aware of it. So it depends. I mean he, he doesn't do it. And uh, it uh, basically you can uh, you can do it. You you have to uh, you have to work harder. And uh, and in some sense, part of what we do is uh, is this. But uh, uh, yeah. So any uh, other? Because as we said, so uh, we feel free to uh, to stop me uh, at any point. Okay, so, um, so let me uh, move to another uh, problem, and this is uh, just a second. Uh, and this is a distinct distance. This was also mentioned by Erdes in the same uh, 1946 uh, uh, paper, short paper. In, the, in fact, this is the first problem mentioned in the paper. In the, he writes there that, uh, uh, okay, so, so let's first see uh, what the question is. So now if distinct distances we denote by D of N with respect to the corresponding NER norm, this is a minimum possible number of distinct distances determined by N points in the Euclidean plane. And the specific question of Erdes was, uh, is it uh, up to constant N over square root of it? So in his paper, he writes that uh, for many years, he tried to improve the bounds he knows the, for this question. Uh, this was 1946, so he was 33 years old. I'm not sure how many, this many years, but uh, this is what he writes. And, uh, uh, and he, uh, again, gives the example of the grid. And for the grid, you just uh, have to know uh, how many numbers uh, are sums of two squares and do we understand it precisely? It's again, uh, in the prime factorization, no prime, which is three mod four can appear in an odd uh, power. So we can uh, work out uh, the asymptotics and, uh, and it is this. Uh, but here indeed, uh, after uh, quite a few initial results, uh, the situation is much better. Namely the best known uh, uh, lower bound uh, uh, due to a uh, Guten cuts is a uh, uh, constant n over log n. So, so it really uh, is uh, nearly tight. Uh, and they use uh, uh, what is called the uh, Elke Scharrier framework to, uh, uh, to transform the problem into an incidence uh, problem. And then, uh, uh, and then they use uh, uh, quite a few uh, additional uh, clever ideas. Uh, so the paper appeared in, uh, in 2015, but actually uh, Larry Good talked about uh, it in this seminar in 2010. So I was, uh, I was organizing the seminar that year and, uh, and Larry was, uh, uh, was here. And I asked him at the beginning of the term uh, if he can talk uh, at some point. And he said that maybe he has something, but he still has to finish it, let's agree on some time late in, uh, in the term uh, in December. And then sometime in November, he sent me a title in abstract. Uh, so I read the uh, abstract, uh, then I read the uh, abstract again. And then I uh, sent him, I just checked yesterday my, uh, uh, my email correspondence with him. Uh, so I wrote, uh, wow, that's great. Can you also say something about the unit distance problem? So this is what mathematicians do, right? You cannot just congratulate someone for a great result. You have to tell him that uh, these are other results that uh, maybe you don't know. So uh, can you? Uh, but, uh, but but anyway, so uh, so here the gap is uh, uh, is pretty small. Uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, here, unlike the situation for the unit distance problem. For higher dimension here, it's also difficult. And, uh, and even the correct exponent uh, 
is not known. Again, the conjecture of Erdish in the same paper is that the grid is always asymptotic with the first example, and the grid just by uh, the fact that every distance, every square distance is a sum of, uh, of squares of small numbers. Uh, so it gives you an upper bound of n to the two over d. And, uh, uh, and the best known lower bound, uh, I'm not completely sure what it is for d equals three. For d equals three, it's a little bit better than what is written here, but, uh, but the correct exponent is not known for any d besides two. And, uh, uh, and here is what is known for, uh, for d bigger than three. Yeah. So, uh, uh, so this question is, uh, uh, is still uh, uh, difficult and uh, very wide open. Uh, and again, one can ask, and people ask, uh, so specifically, uh, this maybe is first time mentioned by a paper of uh, Swampol, uh, what about other norms? And there was this uh, a specific uh, conjecture of uh, a brass uh, uh, that appears in this uh, book of uh, a brass model and power. And this is, uh, so he thought, is it for every two norm, then uh, maybe we can force a number of distinct distances among endpoints to be pretty big, uh, or to be close to linear, but still he thought that maybe it's uh, always little off and as it is uh, in the, uh, for the Euclid case. And, uh, uh, and it turns out that, uh, uh, that this is false, uh, and again, for most nodes, it can be uh, linear in N. Moreover, uh, the constant uh, is one, namely the distinct distance for most, norm, for most norms uh, in the very category sense. It is true that whenever you take n points, then they determine nearly n distinct distances. And moreover, the same holds for uh, all dimensions. Uh, so we still get, uh, so this is a, a result here is that for every fixed D, if N is big enough as a function of D, uh, then for most uh, uh, D norms, uh, uh, the every N points determine at least one magnitude so one times N distances. Uh, okay, and, uh, uh, and again, you can, uh, uh, easily convince yourself that uh, such a thing with constant one cannot hold for any norm like LP norm. So if you take a, a norm in which the formula for the norm is symmetric in the coordinates, something like an LP norm in the plane, if you want, then for the grid, it would only be the number of unordered pairs and not the number of pairs. So definitely the constant will not be one. Okay, okay. 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 Well, I'm confused about this conjecture. So if you take a two norm that's not strictly convex and has some linear piece, can you just take a positive proportion of the points to be collinear on that piece? And you get the right. bigger yeah. number. Yeah, so, uh, uh, so, uh, so if it is not like, like in the uh, in infinity, but uh, uh, but still, the number of uh, uh, of distinct distances will be big, right? So many of them can be one, but still, you would have. Uh, if, 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 so. if you put many of them on this line, like n over two on the line, then they by themselves determine at least n over two distinct distances. Yeah, and they conjecture that for every two norm, the number of distinct distances is little over n. So this is. Counter example, right? right. And, and no, so again, you, you, can yeah, take, uh, you can take a grid and infinity, it will be only square root. Okay, okay. A square root n by square root n grid will be the square root n, right? Just uh, yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, so it's not uh, again, uh, it's uh, we don't have explicit examples. I mentioned it uh, at the end, but uh, this is uh, okay. Uh, now, let me uh, just uh, mention uh, quickly here is that, uh, that the lower bound, of course, does not hold for small values of n. And in fact, there is a conjecture of uh, Petty that asserts that for every d norm, 
well, I wrote it here in terms of a function of distinct distances uh, it's in a complicated way. The D of n is one for all n, which is at most d plus one. This is equivalent to say that in every d norm, you can find d plus one points so that all the distances between them are the same. So this is still open, but it is known that uh, we, you can find uh, uh, at least a number of points that uh, uh, grows to, uh, uh, to infinity again. There is a typo here. So this is uh, uh, n, which is at most two to the b square root law of d. Right. Otherwise, it's satisfying every n, I guess, or some, or it does not. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, uh, Okay, so I have two of them. Now, uh, finally, let me tell you uh, about uh, what happens for this typical for random norms uh, for uh, another uh, old problem. So, uh, uh, this one maybe is more recreational, but still is a nice problem uh, uh, that has been studied quite a lot. And this is the chromatic number of the unity such graph for the Hadwiger Nelson uh, problem. So, what they ask is what is the minimum possible number of colors required to color the points of the a plane uh, so that no two points of distance one have the same color? Or what is the chromatic number of the unit distance graph on the plane? The vertices are the points to which adjacent, if not if the distance between them is one. Okay, uh, so, uh, so this was asked uh, uh, in 1950 by Nelson, actually Hadwiger uh, asked something similar already in 45. And uh, already in the 60s, uh, the uh, uh, bounds of uh, four is a lower bound and seven is an upper bound, uh, uh, which are both simple, were known, and, uh, and this is a proof of both of them. So the lower bound comes from the so-called uh, Moser spindle. So this is a simple graph on seven vertices, uh, just uh, obtained by a five cycle by blowing up, uh, duplicating two vertices. And, uh, and this is a specific graph that can be embedded as a unit distance graph uh, in the plane. And, uh, and its chromatic number is uh, four. And the upper bound is uh, uh, you, uh, uh, you take a, a periodic uh, a tiling uh, by hexagons uh, of the plane and uh, the diameter of each hexagon is just a little bit less than one. And then you can color them by seven colors and uh, this is uh, what you see here. Uh, so these were the known bounds for uh, quite some time until a uh, few years ago when uh, Aubrey de Grey uh, constructed a unit distance graph in the Euclidean plane uh, uh, and with a computer assisted proof, but uh, quite a few uh, clever uh, ideas. Uh, besides that, uh, he showed that its uh, chromatic number is five. Uh, his original graph has uh, about 20,000 vertices uh, and, uh, uh, and then uh, it has been uh, uh, Reduce or maybe now is uh, the smallest such graph uh, that is known as about 500, 509 uh, uh, vertices. Uh, uh, so, uh, so again, here too in the Euclidean plane, the problem is still difficult. It's the chromatic number is between five and seven, and uh, uh, we don't know more about this. But uh, uh, but again, here you can ask uh, what happens for general. And uh, people ask it, uh, so and looked at it. Uh, so there is uh, the following result by Sheila Kamari. It says that uh, for every two norms, the chromatic number is always between four and seven. In fact, every two norm contains uh, the unit distance graph contains this uh, Moser spindle. You can always realize it, uh, and uh, and the seven uh, upper bound is also not too difficult, and. Uh, and here is a, so there are a, a quite a few papers about special cases. I just uh, quoted here uh, two recent ones that uh, for the specific norm in which the unit boy is a regular polygon, so these are not strictly convex, uh, regular polygon with eight, 10, or 12 edges, and the chromatic number is either five or six. So it looks 
difficult to find the chromatic number exactly even for such simple cases. So, so that they, they generalize this hexagonal tiling to some other tiling that we well, That's right, yeah. So always the uh, upper bound uh, will be by some tiling and the uh, and the lower bound requires uh, some work. Yeah, that's what you say. Okay. Uh, now there was uh, uh, the foreign conjecture uh, uh, from uh, uh, 91 by uh, this guy, Sheila Kamari, is that for every strictly convex uh, two norm, so not polygons, then the chromatic number is equal to that of the Euclidean norm. So maybe we don't know what is the chromatic number for the Euclidean norm, but the hope was that for all strictly convex norms, it is the same. And the related uh, problem by Robertson was to determine the exact chromatic number even for a single example of a strictly convex two norm. So we answer uh, the uh, first conjecture and, and maybe we answer the second, depending on how you interpret this problem, because what we uh, know to prove with Nwaki uh, Abuchi and Lisa Sauerman is that for most two norms, the chromatic number is exactly four. It's always uh, exactly four, and it is known, so there is an old result of Cli showing that most two norms are strictly convex. So in particular, uh, this conjecture is false because uh, now we know that the chromatic number for the Euclidean case is at least five, but for most uh, uh, two norms, it is, uh, uh, it is exactly four. And uh, yeah, maybe it answers this, unless you interpret uh, the problem as asking for an explicit. Uh, and we, we don't know an explicit example. Uh, I should say that the proof actually shows that even if you look at the odd distance graph in a typical key norm, so you have a norm and odd distance graph, uh, you join two points by an edge, if and only if the distance between them is an odd integer. So there, uh, there is a, a recent paper by, uh, by Davis uh, showing that for the Euclidean case, there the chromatic number is infinite. Uh, and, uh, and actually uh, for most two norms, it's still four. Right? So it really behaves uh, differently. Okay, so this was uh, up to now a statement uh, of results. And now I'll tell you something about proofs. Uh, I'll not, uh, uh, not say too much, but, uh, but at least uh, I think you'll be able to get the flavor of the things, at least for the uh, unit uh, distance problem, which is a, a bit uh, a, uh, simpler than the distinct distances. Uh. So in nutshell, if you want to say uh, what's going on just in one sentence, uh, the basic idea for the unit distance problem is that if there are many unit distances, then these unit vectors uh, that appear as uh, differences between pairs of points, then they must satisfy many special linear relations, and I'm not saying yet what this means, of its rationals. And because these relations are special, then a norm has to be special in order to satisfy them. And for a norm to be special, it's hard, uh, and this happens only for a set of norms. Okay, so this is what we want to say. And, uh, and I want to tell you a, a little bit more about uh, what what is meant here. So, uh, so more specifically, if we have a unit distance graph on n vertices, and if it spans more than half dn log base two of n edges, then, and this is what I mean by the special linear relations, there are some s unit vectors for some s, so there is some number s, and there are some s unit vectors, that spin over the rationals at least d times s plus one unit vectors. Okay? So this is a, we have a small set of unit vectors that spans a larger set over the rationals of unit vectors. And, uh, and I'll say something why uh, the set of norms that satisfy this is meager. 
but before, uh, before saying a little bit about that, uh, let me tell you where this is coming from. So we, we should so, think of this as being compared to the hypercube uh, where it spans exactly the DS, you said. Uh, that's right. So the hypercube will, uh, will soon appear, but, uh, but it's true. In the hypercube, we didn't have any relations between them, right? We said that we can embed it by taking random vectors. So we could take vectors that do not satisfy any relation and still get n log n. But if we want more than n log n, then uh, right. And, uh, uh, and this is a, a okay. So uh, so this can be proved in a pretty uh, short way, uh, and uh, uh, and basically by combining uh, two known results. Uh, uh, although our initial proof was uh, more direct, but uh, uh, but this. Uh, is shorter. So uh, what we combine is a discrete isopermetric inequality of Volomash and Eder. I'll say a little bit more about it with the matroid partition theorem of uh, Edmonds. And again, I'll tell you a little bit uh, more about, uh, about this too. So, uh, so here are a, a little bit more details. Uh, so suppose we have uh, uh, these uh, endpoints in the plane and we have a lot of unique distances with respect to some norm uh, among them. So what we can do is that uh, uh, this is what you see in this picture uh, uh, here, you, you look at uh, all the distinct vectors that appear as unique distances between pairs of points. And what I did here is that uh, all the copies of the first vector are red and all the copies of the second are black and all the copies of the third are green. And, uh, and this example is a uh, unit distance as it's Euclidean plane, I guess, uh, subject to my uh, limited uh, PowerPoint ability, but, uh, uh, but you can uh, understand what, uh, what this is. And, uh, and the claim is that if all these uh, k different vectors that appear here, like in this picture here, they are independent over the rationals, okay, so they are completely independent, then this graph is really a subgraph of the graph of the k dimensional integer grid. It's isomorphic to a subgraph of the k dimensional uh, grid. And this is because there are no relations, right? So uh, every, uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's see it with a picture here. So we can, uh, uh, in this example here, we can shift this point so that uh, it lies in, uh, or we can think about it as a point zero, zero, zero. And then we write every other point, there is only one way. So we can assume that this graph is connected. And there is only one way to represent every point here as a linear combination of the red, black, and green vectors, right? Because as a linear combination with integer coefficients, uh, because they are linearly independent of the rationals. So this vector here is obtained from the uh, origin by uh, going uh, black and then uh, uh, red and then green. And black here corresponds to uh, adding one in the second coordinate, uh, red to adding one in the first coordinate, and green to adding one in the third coordinate. And we can also reach it in some uh, walking in some different way, but still it would correspond exactly to the same coordinates because these things are linearly dependent over the rationals. Okay. So this is supposed to convince you that any such graph, if we have k distinct vectors, say we kind of assign one dimension to each vector, and then we get this graph as a subgraph of the graph of the k dimensional grid. And in the k dimensional grid, there is a very precise azopermetric inequality saying that any set of endpoints cannot. Uh, uh, if our does not contain more than half n log base two uh, n uh, edges, 
Okay, and in fact, uh, it's even more exact than this. So if n is not a power of two, we can get uh, something very precise here, and uh, and it even says what is the error term. But uh, okay, so that means that if our vectors are completely linearly independent or the rationals, then we cannot have more than half n log n uh, edges. And then uh, just a, uh, a few words about the, about the Edmond theorem. And so if no set S of these unit vectors, then we have this uh, graph that we have the unit vectors, the distinct unit vectors that they appear there as unit distances. And if no set of these unit vectors spans more than D times S of the vectors, then all the vectors can be partitioned into D linearly independent subsets uh, by this uh, matroid partition theorem of Edmonds. So this holds for any matroid, uh, but in particular for the linear matroid, if you have a collection of vectors over some field, and whenever you take uh, X of them, then the total ring of this set of X vectors is at least X over D, then you can partition them into D linearly independent sets. Okay. So because of, uh, because of this, if indeed we know that no set S spends more than D times S uh, of the vectors, then we can split all the set into not more than D linearly independent subsets. Each linearly independent subs subset will contribute at most half n log base two n edges, and altogether we get the claimed bound. So this is really uh, the upper bound, but we still have to prove that indeed for most norms, we don't expect to get S unit vectors that span over the rationals, S plus one or more than SD, other unit vectors, and I say a very little about this, uh, so we want to show that the set of norms that satisfy these things that have some S vectors spanning over the rationals, many others, is meager. So it suffices to show that for any fixed rational matrix A, which describes the way this say uh, S unit vectors span the SD plus one others, and for each rational small epsilon, okay, uh, the set of D norms in which there are S D plus one unit vectors and S unit vectors that uh, satisfy this uh, uh, rational matrix A, and so that the angle between any two of the vectors is at least epsilon, so they are epsilon separated, it's enough to show that the set of norms for each such fixed A and fixed epsilon is nowhere dense. And the important thing is that uh, that there are only countably many choices for the rational matrix and for the epsilon. Right? So this is why it's so useful. It's like uh, in probability when we have the union of countably many events of probability zeros and still the probability zero, and uh, uh, and this is uh, uh, often convenient. So so this is what we uh, want to show here. And uh, and I say uh, only a little about this. Uh, so in order to show this, uh, uh, so now we have a fixed matrix A and a fixed epsilon, and we want to show that uh, the set of norms for which there are vectors that uh, satisfy the above with A and, uh, and epsilon is nowhere dense. So what we do is that we look at uh, the unit ball of a, of a norm, so it's this, uh, and then we approximate it by a, uh, just a convex a, a polytope. And we want uh, that uh, it will be a good approximation of the unit ball. And we also want that each facet uh, of this uh, uh, polytope will have very small diameter, diameter much smaller than epsilon, of course. Uh, okay. And then, uh, if we have, so we have this polytope B prime, and if we have the S vectors on the boundary of B prime, namely unit vectors according to the norm determined by this polytope, 
and they span SD plus one other vectors on this boundary with a matrix here, and the uh, and it's important that all these vectors lie on distinct facets of B prime, which we can ensure because the diameter of each face is small, and we said that the vectors are epsilon separated. Then if you look at the constant terms of the constraints defining the facets of the polytope, they have to satisfy some specific linear relation. And this is a, so, so at least a, uh, this explains why we have this SD plus one here. Uh, because S vectors, the number, the total number of their coordinates is S times D. And if all together we spend SD plus one facets or vectors corresponding to facets, then we have this SD plus one constant terms of the constraints. And there are more of them and then we have variables, so some linear equation has to be satisfied. And, uh, and of course, the linear equation is not going to be satisfied if we perturb the constant terms a little bit. So if we take a generic choice of these constant terms, then this equation will not be satisfied. And in fact, uh, even if we are in the neighborhood of such a perturbed thing, it will still not be satisfied, right? Because this is a, so a, uh, so here one has to still say something, but, uh, but basically this is going, what's going on. And this shows that the set of norms with uh, S epsilon separated unit vectors spanning S D plus one unit vectors according to A is nowhere dense and then we take the union over all these countably many A's and epsilons and, uh, and we get that the thing is neither. So there are some details here, but hopefully this is convincing enough. Uh, let me use the uh, uh, last, uh, uh, ah, okay. So, so I still want to say that this will be very, uh, just uh, uh, to mention the buzzwords, that for the distinct distances uh, problem, it's, uh, the argument is, uh, is more difficult. And, uh, uh, and instead of showing that uh, we don't expect to find a, a set of, a, a, of S vectors that spend some many other vectors uh, with, uh, uh, over the rationals, here we have to work uh, over the extension field of the rationals generated by the distinct distances. So we have these distinct distances. And then uh, the linear uh, uh, algebra argument uh, has to be replaced by more sophisticated algebraic argument because uh, instead of linear equations, we get some polynomial equations or rational equations. Uh, so we have to do something. And let me also mention that additional tools applied in the proofs uh, include the following. So one of them is a uh, a very nice uh, a combinatorial uh, result of uh, Ungar that says that uh, whenever we have endpoints in the plane, the usual equivalent plane, uh, uh, and they are not all on the line, they determine at least n minus one uh, distinct uh, uh, slopes, directions. Right? So the number of directions is uh, at least n minus one. Uh, this is tight uh, uh, for a uh, and even depending on the parity of n, sometimes you can replace uh, n by n minus one by n, but this is not uh, crucial. So this is one point. Uh, then uh, we use this uh, uh, classical result of a uh, Hurwitz uh, from a uh, dimension theory. So from uh, topology, uh, as I say, I'm only saying the passwords. And, uh, uh, and the matroid covering theorem of Edmonds Falkerson that uh, is a, 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 an extension of the Edmonds uh, Metroid uh, partition theorem. But, uh, but I don't want to say much about this. Uh, uh, let me just uh, mention some uh, open problems uh, before we finish. Uh, uh, so about the distinct distances, we said that uh, for most D norms, uh, every uh, N points, if N is big as a function of V, 
determine at least uh, n minus little of n distances. In fact, the bound that we, the lower bound that we get from the proof is n minus some constant dn to three quarters. Uh, it might be true, as far as we know, that, uh, that if n is big, then, uh, then d of n is exactly n minus one. So always you can find uh, in any norm, you can just put points on arithmetic progression on the line and then they determine only n minus one distinct distances. It might be that uh, you cannot do better than that uh, uh, in, a, uh, in a random norm. So for most norms, uh, we don't know to prove it, but we don't know that, uh, that this is false. Uh, here is another one. So, uh, uh, so all these statements are about uh, most norms. Uh, and uh, it would be uh, interesting to find an explicit example of a two norm uh, or a D norm for which uh, uh, this uh, number of unit distances is most n log n, or the number of distinct distances is at least omega n, or at least uh, n minus little n. Uh, uh, as I said, uh, we cannot uh, uh, hope that uh, uh, something like this uh, holds at least in dimension at least four for any symmetric norm, but, uh, but explicit can be, uh, does not have to be uh, uh, something like LP. Uh, in fact, if you want uh, uh, to think about this question formally, you have to define explicitly what is meant by explicit and uh, uh, and here I wrote uh, one possible explicit definition. So, uh, uh, so let me call a norm explicit. If the norm of any given input point can be computed efficiently in some standard model of real computation. So we have a formula or we have an algorithm. Okay. So, uh, so we don't know any explicit example. Uh, uh, here is something about the chromatic number question. Uh, so the proof really gives that uh, if you are in dimension D, not dimension two, then the chromatic number of the unity distance graph of most norms is at most two to the D. In the, <clears throat> and it's also true that for any finite subgraph with endpoints, the chromatic number is at most D log N. The question is if the chromatic number of the whole unit distance graph is at most polynomial in D. It looks that it should be true, but, uh, uh, but at least the proof we know uh, does not give us, uh, uh, does not give it. Uh, the chromatic number is always by compactness obtained by a chromatic number of a finite graph. So because of what is written here, if it is exponential, then this finite graph will have to have double exponential with many points and uh, and this is a uh, difference in what's uh, happening uh, for, uh, uh, for the Euclidean case. Uh, okay. And uh, finally, uh, and again, uh, motivated by uh, uh, the analog thing for a random, uh, uh, random graphs or random structures, uh, uh, it's interesting uh, to know if there is a zero law, one law for a unit distance graph. So for example, I was talking about the chromatic number of, a, a, of almost all D norms, but we don't even know that almost all of them have the same chromatic number. It could be as far as I know that uh, many, uh, so, so I wrote here something specific. Uh, is it following true that uh, for every fixed finite graph H, either H is a subgraph of the unit distance graph of most T norms, or it is not a subgraph of the unit distance graph of most D norms? It's important to realize that the alternative here is not the, just a negation of the first thing. So that it looks that it cannot be true that you have some fixed graph H and it will be a subgraph of any norm that is very close, say, to the Euclidean norm, but will not be a subgraph of any norm 
that is close to the L infinity norm. Right, so, so this is uh, this means uh, a zero and low, and uh, uh, and this is the last question. They have here three pictures. So, so this is a four cube embedded as a unity descent graph in the Euclidean plane. So it has 16 vertices and 32 edges. This is actually a graph with a 16 vertices and 40 edges, which is still a unit distance graph in the Euclidean plane. The exact a, a maximum possible number of unit distances is known for n up to 14. So for 16, it's already not known in the Euclidean. And this is a, a graph from the uh, Aubrey de Prey uh, paper. This already has only 1567 vertices, and it's a unit distance graph. And uh, uh, in the Euclidean plane, this chromatic number is five, as, as you can uh, see here. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, and with this, uh, I'll finish. Uh, uh, thank you. Yeah. So in the plane, if you wanted to ask a similar question, not about a typical norm, but say about a typical LP norm. Right, yeah. You know, so it's so it's a good question. We thought a little bit about it. So like choose a, a random P and a, and it's likely that something is true there, but we have no idea. So definitely this might methods cannot prove such a thing because, because there are not enough LP norms. Uh, and, uh, and it looks that uh, it should be true, but, but it looks that this is more related to questions in number theory or in, uh, I don't know. I mean, so for every specific P, uh, like a random P or even if P is a pi, I don't know, I mean, it's probably, Probably such norms uh, are pretty good. Uh, uh, as I said, once we go to dimension four, such a thing cannot be good anymore. But it, it will be nice to know something about, uh, about LP norms or about any. Right, yeah. yeah, but even Euclidean, so some of the feeling is that Euclidean we understand better. And uh, and there is a big gap between what we know and what we conjecture for Euclidean, even in dimension two. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Um, this is sort of related to Orr's question. Um, if you're, if you want to know about uh, most two norms, say that are symmetric, so the norm of x y is equal to the norm of y x. Okay. This probably I, I didn't think about it right, but this probably we. Thing. I think that, uh, that there are enough of those that the topology would, uh, would be good enough to, uh, to kind of say that if I take a random norm, which is symmetric, uh, then, uh, uh, then I expect that, uh, that I would be able to, uh, to prove uh, this, right. this type of thing. They are a major set. That what? By themselves, that they're a meager set in the general collection of two norms. Right. Yeah. But, but I hope. But I think that there are enough of them that uh, that we would be able to. Uh, so I kind of expect. I may be wrong, but but I my initial guess would be that the space of them already is a bare space. So, uh, but if I'm wrong, I, I may be wrong here. So this is just a guess. It looks to me that. Uh, <laughs> There are lots of them, right? I mean, so that, uh, yeah, exactly. But any other? Uh, so you're using the assumption that uh, these are norms in the isoparametric inequality, right? But Say that again. Uh, I'm, uh, Okay, I'm yeah. trying to understand where are you using the assumption that it's a norm and not just a convex body? Like, uh, no, I basically just use the fact that it's a convex body. So if you, uh, 
if you would want to ask, let's take a convex uh, body in the plane and think about it as defining distances, uh, then, uh, then everything we, we said would work for that as well. And if it's not convex, I guess you need the first step with the isoparametric, uh, right? The okay, if it's not convex. No, I think the isoparametric didn't care uh, much about, uh, I mean, this was only about uh, linear independence uh, over the rational set. Uh, so you have you have a body really, and you you look at uh, translates of it, and you ask uh, how how many of them uh, touch each other, right? This would be the unit uh, the unit distance problem somehow, mm -hmm. and uh, and then uh, I think everything would uh, uh, would work uh, uh, as it is. So why do you need convexity? I, yeah, I didn't, I mean, I, I guess that- uh, Oh, so not even convex. Really, right, yeah. Yeah, so- Okay. Yeah, you could, uh, so if you want to uh, to generalize the, uh, all these problems, which you can, to completely general bodies, right? So, so you have this uh, curve, I got on the plane, and then uh, the curve tells me what does it mean to be of unit distance in each direction. And then maybe the chromatic number is uh, two points are not allowed uh, to be of distance that is not allowed in this uh, direction. Then, uh, uh, yeah, then still uh, it would uh, uh, it would work. Uh, yeah, it, it would work in the same. Uh, in the same way, we, we would have to uh, to say something about that the space of all curves uh, is uh, is a pair space that the complement of any meager set is uh, uh, is non-empty or dense, uh, depends what you want to. Uh, but uh, but I don't see anything that would not. Uh, it's just that the, the question is less uh, maybe is less natural. Uh, okay. Yeah, but it's uh, but it's a good to have the opportunity to see a face actually, not, uh, not <laughs> right okay. you 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 are somewhere here, right? Uh, actually, uh, I'm I'm here. I might join you for lunch. I just uh, I'll explain. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I I told the people here that uh, the danger of uh, of doing things available by Zoom also is that. Uh, why would people bother to come? Right? So I think usually I was more adamant about yeah, uh, yeah, coming. Yeah. Yeah. So the board is that is yeah. yeah, yeah, it's okay. Yeah. Okay, any other? Uh... You also study the problem for uh, equidistant sets. I know you have a paper with L1 norm. Uh, what is the story there for typical norm? Right, so the equidistance is uh, this question of, uh, of petty that I mentioned. Yeah. They, uh, and this is the question, given a norm space, what is the maximum number of points that you can have? So that the distance between any two is the same. So this is conjectured to be at least the plus one for any, uh, for any norm, it's a, for some norms it's much more, right? For any infinity, term, it can be a two to the D or the, and, uh, and it's kind of related in the sense that it's the distinct distances, but for small values of, uh, of n. Uh, right, yeah, I don't, uh, uh, yeah, it's a, uh, when we know something about petty, we can use it uh, to get uh, maybe improved lower bounds for some specific norms, but, uh, but this question of uh, of petty, so so as we said, as you said, the equilateral dimension is not known even in very simple uh, uh, spaces like L one. So even in L one D, we don't know if the maximum possible number of points, so that the distance between any two is the same, is two D. The conjecture is two times D, and uh, and this is not known. So it looks difficult even for some very simple. <laughs> Okay, good, so thanks again.